Okay. So uh, if I can please just have a thumbs up to make sure um, that, every, that it is actually showing and that you guys can all see what's happening. Thanks very much, Kerry. I am feeling a little bit better, not 100%, but I'm getting there. Mm. Janice, I see you've raised your hand. I presume you're telling me that everything's cool. Perfect. So today we're going to be discussing online support groups. And um, when we initially envisaged the session, we wanted to do a lot of information on the types of groups, you know, the types of formats and forums that are available. But uh, when I was developing the content, I actually realized that there was probably a big need um, to address, you know, the benefits, etc, of actually having running a support group as well. So I do focus on that quite a bit. Uh, right. So some of our discussion points today, what is a support group, setting up a support group, um, location and organization, developing some ground rules, um, you know, what is the best format or structure, etc. So I'm giving you, we definitely not experts, um, but we have host, hosted quite a few of these meetings and um, we're just going to give you an overview from how we see it and what we know works for us. So what is a um, what is a support group? I'm just trying to close all these things. Okay, so a support group is essentially a group of people that come together for a common purpose or when dealing with a particular issue. Um, there's various types. So you can have a formal group, which is facilitated by a trained facilitator, or you can have an informal group, which I think is the majority, excuse my puppy, uh, which I think is the majority of um, the groups that will be present here today. And they are generally member led. So it is a group of people that have come together for a common cause and it's not necessarily an overly formal or structured environment. And then you've got general groups, which, um, you know, as for an example, you can have, I'm going to use the example of a general disease group. So you can have, um, seeing that Catherine's online, we'll use her as the example, um, a group for kids that are impacted by a juvenile arthritis. So that's a general group. It is to discuss all things related to children impacted by juvenile arthritis. However, a focus group would might be discussing treatments within uh, the JIA space. So it would be a little bit more focused and focusing on a particular topic. They can also be open. So they can be open for members to drop in at any time. You don't have to formally um, and participate you can attend some and not others or they could be closed which requires some form of jo joining process and a vetting process and a generally a closed group will also um, require some form of commitment um, from a patient you know from a patient perspective so they either um, are obligated to pay a membership fee or they would have to um, you know participate a certain amount of times per year etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, right, setting up a support group. So the first thing that you need to ask yourself is what the purpose and the participants, who will the participants be? So the purpose is essentially, um, you know, determining what exactly this group is aiming to achieve. Is it, um, you know, to provide social support and education support, etc., which is often what a lot of our groups do? Or have you set up a group specifically to address a specific problem? So say, for instance, um, a group of patients are battling to access a certain type of medication in one particular hospital. Uh, they might put up a specific group to address the issues around that particular problem. And it wouldn't be a continuous thing because once the issue had been resolved, um, essentially the, the, the essence or the need for the group would go away. So it's very, very important that you've established this from the outset because it tells you um, how you should structure your group um, and also, you know, how long it would continue for and who should be uh, included and who not. Um, so also you've got to ask yourself about participation. You know, is the group aimed at anybody impacted by the disease? Is it only for parents? Is it for um, caregivers? Can grandparents join as well? And those are really important things, particularly in our rare disease space where the need for support is so vast and so many in, uh, people within the uh, patient area would be dealing with um, a variety of issues within that. So it's not necessarily just the patient that always needs support, but that obviously extends through to extended family members. Even clinicians sometimes um, will require support there too. If you can just give me one second, um, I can hear my phone is ringing continuously. My son has left it on the floor. Okay. 
So um, with regards to the facilitator, who will facilitate or lead the group? And this isn't something that has to be set in stone. I mean, you might decide that you want to do a rotational facilitatorship where um, every meeting, you know, through the course of a year, if you've decided that you're going to meet once every two months, that you, you know, have a different person every, um, that you take turns in facilitating that. You might choose to bring somebody in from an external perspective. Um, so it doesn't need to be um, a formal process and it doesn't need to rest on one person's shoulders. But the most important thing with regards to facilitating is that it's that you know who's going to be doing it because there is a responsibility to doing that and that that person is comfortable um, and has opted to do it and they're not feeling like they're forced to facilitate. It's also important to remember that in these groups, um, very often, you know, people share a, a ton of information. It's a very, it's intended to be a very safe space for them. So by providing them with that space, you almost also need to have a catch net for any patients that are requiring further support. So you need to be able to identify patients that aren't coping and make sure that you have um, the ability to either refer them on to extensive counseling or, um, you know, touch base with them afterwards on whatever it was that they were battling with. But that's important because uh, otherwise the purpose of the group essentially, you know, doesn't achieve what it's aimed to do. But people do start sharing quite a bit within this space um, because for, for many of them, it's the first time uh, that they've had the opportunity or it's the only time that they have the opportunity to continuously connect with issues that are very, very close to them and are very, very personal with individuals who are going through something so similar, which is a very rare opportunity, I'm sure you know, um, within our space. So it's very, very important that they get the opportunity to do that. And then with regards to partnering, also just uh, something to bear in mind that if there is an organization in your area that provides um, services to your target audience to touch base with them on, you know, common interests, etc, but also so that they can help raise awareness around your group and what you are trying to achieve. Um, and that you've got that mutually beneficial referral partnership in place, which is always very, very helpful. Okay, so location and organization. These are some of the questions you need to ask yourself um, when deciding on what you're wanting to do. So at the moment, we're discussing sort of pre meeting phase. So what you're trying to do. So um, you need to determine how often the group will meet. And it's important um, to get community feedback when doing this, because, you know, you as the organizer might feel that you want to only meet once every three months and the group feels that they need to meet more regularly than that, or vice versa. You might feel that you want to meet more regularly and they feel, you know, once a year is adequate. Um, where will the group meet? Um, obviously, we're discussing digital because that's the way that everything's gone, but uh, there is there might still be the space for in-person meetings. So discuss exactly what you want to do and also what format you want to do, want to use, and that it remains consistent. Um, what time will the group meet and for how long? So, you know, do you want to have more frequent shorter meetings or do you want to have longer, less frequent meetings? Um, will the group be closed or open, as I said earlier? Um, will the group run for a certain number of weeks? Is it, is it going to be a group for this year or is it going to be an ongoing thing? Uh, who will delegate responsibilities and, and the group rules? Um, and that's why I said it's so important that you have actually selected a facilitator because there are responsibilities with that. Um, will you be charging people to partake? Um, if you're obviously having a meeting, um, that uh, an in-person meeting, will there be refreshments and meals and snacks, etc.? And if so, how will they be paid for? And very often, um, particularly for those that are servicing state areas, you find that you need to incentivize or provide options for childcare or transportation assistance, et cetera, for patients to be able to attend. And even now in this time, when we're discussing digital, um, we often provide data. Uh, to patients who are um, needing, we are wanting their input at these sort of meetings. So those are, you know, they, they sometimes is a cost implication and it's important to bear that in mind. I um, hope I'm not speaking too quickly, guys. Um, right, so with regards to getting the group started, very important to create the right atmosphere. And like I was saying earlier, it is it's so these spaces need to be safe um, confidentiality needs to remain absolutely key they need to be welcoming it's 
It needs to be a non-judgmental atmosphere where participants um, can feel comfortable in sharing their feelings and sharing their hardships without any judgment. And it's also helpful to explain what confidentiality means so that all the members that partake in the group have the same understanding and expectations for privacy. So very important to make sure um, that, you know, you've had that discussion. Confidentiality to me might mean a lot more than it does to the next individual. So say, you know, for the purposes of this group, um, we request that uh, no patient information is shared. Um, you know, we expect X, Y, and Z in terms of confidentiality so that the expectations are clear. And then in terms of outreach, when a group is new, um, participation might still be very, very small. And it's important that you don't let that get you down. Um, I think a lot of individuals who want to do this and really want to start up a support group and re meet individuals regularly get very discouraged when only three people show up. Um, but not to be discouraged, it takes particularly because of the sensitive nature in which we, um, you know, that we discuss in our groups because of the work that we do. Um, it takes a while sometimes for people to trust the process and want to actually open up. And if the group is obviously open to new members to increase awareness by posting updates um, at the local organizations on social media, et cetera, et cetera, and keep refreshing people as to who the group is and what they do and um, you know, the important objectives, et cetera, that you're trying to achieve. And then also um, include the names of the facilitators so that if anybody has any questions outside of when the group is meeting, that they are able to actually send those through and get the information that they need. So as the number of participants grow, you will now need to start developing some ground rules. And ground rules are really, really important to have because they ultimately develop the rules of engagement um, and they are the basis in which the group will run. So it's important to include, I've mentioned it, I'm stressing it here, the expectations around confidentiality, particularly now with the Puppy Act where it is so critically important not to share information without explicit consent. Um, openness and respect. Um, it's very, very important that to realize that you might not agree necessarily on the same principles. Um, you might have a difference of opinion. What works for one patient might not work for another. And that is okay. How will you deal with um, issues around, you know, when there is um, there is disconsensus or there's a disagreement, how will you de deal with it? And, you know, what the expectations are in terms of behavior and how members respond to conflict in that environment. So it's very important to have those ground rules established. Also to discuss um, things like language, what language um, from a practical perspective, what language will the group be um, carried out in, but also to ensure that you're not using jargon or language that can uh, cause offense. And then obviously promptness, which is which is really important, I think, particularly for the facilitators. Um, you want to know that you know that your um, groups are starting on time, etc. I think it's just a sign of it's a sign of respect to those that are putting the groups together. So some ground rules need to be developed. And then obviously, as the group grows, to deal with issues immediately, and there will always be issues. You can be absolutely 100% sure. There's always going to be somebody that has a problem with something, and that's fine. Um, these are supposed to be safe places, so they should be able to raise those issues, um, but it's best to not let them harbor and deal with them as soon as you are aware of them. Um, I'm gonna use some of the examples that you guys might see that sometimes crop up on um, our patient voices group. Very often, um, if there's an issue that crops up, I'll often send a voice note just addressing it immediately. Because otherwise, if um, you know if things someone sensitive towards something, or they feel that the issue is not being addressed, it just creates fractions, and um, you obviously don't want that. Very important to remember as well that there's always going to be different personalities, both between participants and facilitators. And when there's a difference of personality, sometimes it causes tension. That's also okay, as long as you can find ways, constructive ways in which to deal with that. Um, there may be times when the group process has become difficult and you might wanna quit. I think we've all experienced this. 
If that happens, try to reconnect with the reason you started the group. And that's why doing that work in the beginning in terms of developing that foundation is so important because in times where you're like, it's not working, we're not achieving things, go back to those initial um, questions that you asked yourself and the identifying the purposes and, and revert back to them and then actually see if you are making the progress. And if you're the group's leader or organizer, it's also okay to rotate out of your role and become a member, a regular member of the group. So if you feel that that managing the group has become too hard and it's it's too emotional or you your circumstances have changed, um, it is okay to ask for help and to switch that out. There's never an expectation that somebody has to do the same thing over and over again forever. So what are the benefits of a support group? And I'm now speaking from a support group perspective, not, not only from a digital group. Um, one is obviously the realization that you're not alone. Two is being the opportunity to be able to express your feelings. Um, three, it's learning the helpful information that you very often don't get from anybody other than uh, your, your own community. It helps you improve your social skills and it also helps you learn how to you know, talk about sensitive stuff um, share your story in a way that you're comfortable with. It, it gives you those added that added confidence and the added skills, uh, gaining hope, reducing distress, increased self understanding, and helping others. So, when should I conduct a virtual meeting? So, timing is critical. Although virtual meetings are very convenient to use anytime and anywhere, it doesn't mean that they always be good for productivity. Um, and timing is everything. So like for this meeting, we sent out a, a questionnaire first asking, you know, what suits everybody best? Is it the afternoon? Is it the morning? You've got to have meetings at a time that suits the large majority of the communication. There's a very, very helpful tool called Doodle, uh, D-O-O-D-L-E, uh, doodle.com. And essentially there you can put in a couple of time slots and people can vote and it gives you um, the most popular time for everybody. And that's really, really quick and efficient in terms of being able to set up the most convenient time. And then meetings, anything over 90 minutes are considered too long. And I would say that was the general assertion. And I think now even, even less so um, because we are all functioning primarily online at the moment. So I think even 90 minutes you know, when we were used to working face-to-face uh, -face with people and you only had to come online for 90 minutes, it was okay. But now that we're all online all the time, I would say probably to reduce that to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour would be good. So the benefits of virtual meeting platforms. So one is that no time is wasted, which is fantastic. You don't have travel time. You don't have costs to get there and back which is awesome. Two, it provides a good opportunity to spread knowledge. You can record meetings, you can share, you can share what was learned afterwards, which is really, really helpful. You can invite as many people as is necessary. So you're not limited in terms of space. Um, you can have different meeting schedules. Um, you're, uh, there's often very easy to use interfaces. You can record the meetings. Just remember to get consent prior to recording. And then, you know, obviously that there's a cost reduction um, because online meetings are a lot more affordable than what they are to have personal meetings. <clears throat> the disadvantages of a virtual meeting is there's often less direct interaction. Like right now, I'm speaking to a screen. I can't see all of you. I don't know how you guys are reacting. I'm not sure if you're loving it or hating it, or if I've still got your attention, and that can sometimes make it difficult. Um, a way to res re obviously resolve that issue is for everybody to have their cameras on. This is a webinar, so this isn't the same, but if you were having a meeting to ev for everybody to have their cameras on, but that often uses a lot of bandwidth and can often create an unstable connection. Uh, and then often, you know, obviously we have connectivity issues. I think we've all heard over the last year and a half, can you hear me? Sorry, you're breaking up. Oh, there was a glitch, I missed that. So that happens a lot. There's less human contact. And I think that that's one of the things that we're gonna miss the most is actually you know, having the presence, seeing people, smelling people, feeling them, knowing that they're there. Um, hacking, hacking does happen. Um, and that's why it's really important to use platforms that have password protection. And then obviously reading people online can be tough. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to pick up on people's cues. You can't necessarily see their body language. Um, you're not sure if they're comfortable with the content. Um, 
you know, if you're having a discussion with someone about something very, very sensitive and you're getting to a point where it's too sensitive, very often you'll be able to see that by reading their body language, but you can't do that on a, on a virtual platform, which makes it difficult. Right. So the online facilitator, what is different with online facilitation to normal facilitation? And um, how does the facilitator fit into the group? So it's important to remember that the facilitator is still an equal member of the group. And in support groups, hierarchy shouldn't exist. So it shouldn't be a case of while there's a facilitator and someone that's guiding the conversation, they, their opinion shouldn't be deemed to be more important than the next person. And it's important to remember that a facilitator is neither the teacher nor the expert. So um, it's really important for there to be that flat sort of um, structure that everybody feels that, they, that their voice is equally as heard and that there's no um, um, condescending or um, disrespectful, um, you know, dismission, dismissiveness of anybody's um, opinion or feelings. Um, the facilitator may need to give newcomers an orientation to the audio and video controls of the technology. So to explain to people how to mute and unmute themselves and turn the camera on or off or how to use the chat function and when to use these features. And um, that's something that's very, very important. We, you know, it's never presume that everybody knows all the formats because not everybody does. Consider co-facilitators to assist with tech requirements. So um, like now, Nicola is also logged on um, because Nicola is able to help me admit people in or answer a technical question, or she will let me know if something's not working. And that's sometimes very, very helpful. So even if you've got someone in your group who doesn't want to necessarily lead facilitate, they might be willing to help you with the admin behind the scenes, so to speak. And if you're new to this, let people know. Um, people have become very, very forgiving. I think we've all had meetings where things have gone pear-shaped um, and something's not working, etc. So don't feel bad to say, look, it's my first time facilitating. Please just bear with me. Everybody can accept that everyone's trying their best in these circumstances. So tips on handling difficult group members. Whew. And uh, yeah, sometimes I can assure you, you, there will always be a few. So there's times to use assertive caring. And assertive caring is really, um, it's still showing support, um, but in a very, very guided way. So things like when a member's often late to meetings or when they monopolize the discussion, they talk over someone, um, they, you know, overwhelm the group with their problems, etc. cetera. Um, they keep interrupting those sorts of times. It's very, very important that you show that you understand the member's position. So use language such as, yes, I understand how you feel. However, um, set limits, gently but firmly correct the behavior. So uh, with regards to coming late, just a reminder, please, that we start, this meeting starts religiously at four o'clock and we would very much appreciate if you would make the effort to attend on time. It's not schooling them, but it is, notifying them that they haven't behaved in a manner that's acceptable to the group and given them an option to um, uh, correct that behavior. Always suggest an alternative. So like I was saying now, explain what you'd like the member to see and, and do instead of just harping on the negative behavior. So not to just scold them and leave them at that, you know, leave it at that, but to actually give them a corrective measure. And then get the member's agreement on the alternative. Make sure that they understand what's being asked of them and then that, that they agree to do it. So, I mean, do you think it's not, you know, to ask the question, do you think that that's reasonable to expect that you, you know, that we can start promptly at four o'clock? So to just, and to just do it in a loving and supportive way, but that is often very, very necessary. What are the things that make an online group good? So inclusiveness is everything. Um, it's probably the most important aspect. As I was saying, everybody needs to feel that they have just as equal opportunity to be able to raise their opinions and queries and um, you know, share. An ideal group size is about 10 to 12 people. Um, it's dependent on you, um, obviously as a group, but um, and obviously your discussions and topics, et cetera. 
However, when there's too many people, people feel that they didn't have enough time to share, um, the meetings run way over time, and then you have less engagement. Um, so 10 to 12 is sort of the ideal um, group size. Um, yeah, if there's more than 12 that are intending, say, for instance, you have decided that you're only going to have two meetings a year, then you want to maybe consider doing things like breakout rooms, where you have co-facilitators that then um, you have discussion areas and you break out into smaller groups so that that discussion and discourse can take place. And then obviously in terms of having agreements, so with regards to guidelines, etc., about how many members will support themselves and each other is important. So it's also very, very important that that's, um, you know, with regards to um, having agreements and consensus in place, um, members need to understand what they're there for and what they will get out of the group. And they also need to contribute to ensuring that the group remains relevant and um, achieves its objectives. What is the best format or structure for an online group? So I'm going to run through what the process, um, what we've seen the process is. And then once we're done, I'm hoping that we'll have um, the opportunity to have feedback and you guys can ask questions. So um, firstly, you've got to open the group. So briefly introduce yourself, um, which I didn't do today, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, briefly introduce yourself, describe how you uh, people need to mute themselves, how they need to use the chat features, um, in a small group where you are waiting, you know, you're wanting to encourage the two-way communication, which is generally the case for an online group, you would actually ask people to check in. So use something like, uh, let us know who you are and what your favorite food is, or, um, you know, very often adding an icebreaker into things really, really helps people feel more comfortable, um, particularly new members. Um, uh, I like at the moment asking people to stand up so that you can see what they're wearing because a lot of people are like business in the top, you know, party at the bottom. Um, while members are checking in, uh, take note of who they are um, and what they've said so, so that you can, you know, it helps you with the facilitating of discussion if you know who they are and um, where they come from or whatever their little introduction was if you remember that um, it makes them feel like they may, they had a, a, a really good presence so that helps from a facilitation perspective <clears throat> right the next um yeah the next thing is to have the discussion around um support and comfort and that is to again determine the the rules of engagement so say things like how can we help you guys stay present today? Do we all agree that um, we're going to speak in English? Um, do we agree that we'll stop every 45 minutes for a 10 minute bathroom break uh, and get the group consensus beforehand so people don't get frustrated or feel as though that they didn't have, um, you know, that they were just forced to do things a certain way. Um, set the group rules. So um, uh, discuss, do you want videos on or off? Um, you know, maybe you want to limit how much time everybody has for feedback on a certain topic um, and then after everybody's had a chance to agree on those rules um, then obviously post them in the chat so that everybody can reference them through um, through it and just remember that language matters so your tone of voice matters how you communicate how you present yourself as well as obviously the the primary language that's used because understanding and being able to have context is also very very important when discussing sensitive issues and then you will move on to the group discussion phase, um, and this is obviously, you know, obviously the main, the main bulk of what you're trying to do. Give the format. So say to people, if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand, or if you would like to ask a question submitted via the Q&A, or what, however it is that you want to do it, but make sure that they know how they can participate in the conversation that's uh, in a manner that's recognized and agreed upon by the group. Try to keep context on point. Um, so if you're discussing how you felt um, you know, at the time of diagnosis, um, try and make sure that the that the members provide feedback that is guided towards that particular topic and clearly describe how to join the discussion otherwise people might start talking over each other which can be frustrating for everyone so when everyone unmutes at the same time it creates a big loud noise and it's just not fun so make sure that you have actually notified them of how they can raise their issue or participate then with regards to wrapping up um before the end of the group, ask if people came with something, if they came with something that they hope to get 
and have they left with it? So if you came to this particular meeting today to get a better understanding of how you can run a support group, and then hopefully at the end of it, you'll be able to say, yes, I did. And it's always important for the facilitator to get that feedback because it gives you an idea of what you need to change. If any urgent needs arise, uh, possibly to save those topics for the future. So if we're discussing today something around global warming and we decide that, you know, we realize that there's not enough education around the icebergs melting, you might want to pin it and actually set down a follow-up discussion time. Um, also ask for those who've been quiet if they've had any thoughts or observations, but in doing so, um, don't necessarily force them. Um, so it gives them an offer, you know, it opens the floor for those who might be a little more shy or a little more introverted to actually raise their, to bring their points, but don't finger point someone and say, I haven't heard from you today, is everything okay? Because it's very important to remember that participation is voluntary. And sometimes all a patient want is, wants to do is to sit back and just listen, and that's okay. Then with regards to closing, before everyone leaves, offer a way to bring the group to closure. So you might ask everybody to say something like uh, how they felt about attending the group or, um, you know, rate today's meeting out of 10 or whatever it might be. And then also be sure to invite people to come back and uh, set the time and date for the next meeting so that it's clear and that you've communicated that and left with a open-ended conversation in mind that patients know that they are welcome to come back and that you would like them to come back. How to keep the support group going. So this I think is probably one of the most critical things. We all start things with the greatest of intention and tons of passion and enthusiasm. And then unfortunately you become tired, your circumstances change. Um, you know, and as a result of that, these groups land up falling away. So it's important to ask for support. Ask your support group members for help. If it's in drafting agendas, sending out notices, recruiting new members, whatever it might be, ask for the help. Don't try to do it all on your own. It, it just, it doesn't work. Ask for feedback. Make sure that um, people are getting what they need out of the group and that, um, you, it just helps you do the facilitation that much better when you have an understanding of what it is that people want from this forum. Keep everything confidential. It's so important because of the sensitivity in which uh, and the sensitive topics that patients discuss in these meetings to make sure that everything, you know, nobody wants to hear that they shared their heartbreaking story and then that was shared in a, in a, you know, it makes them feel completely vulnerable if that was then shared outside of that group. And keep growing the support group continuously, you know, always tell people about it, always encourage people to join, and then celebrate the successes. You know, if this week you had three members and the next meeting you have five, be proud of those moments. Take a moment to pat yourself on the back. Some helpful tips. Always share your URL links to participants the day before the meeting, just to remind them to join and so that they can familiarize themselves with the platform, et cetera, if necessary. Always start and be on time. A courtesy does not just end because work is not currently being done from home. Um, and I'm, this is my biggest flaw. I'm, I'm, I think I've been more late for meetings now that I'm working online than ever in my life. Um, it communicates to participants what behaviors will be expected of them during the meeting encourage participation by using features that allow individuals to be highlighted when speaking um, and also encourage variance. You know, some people like speaking and want to raise their hands and verbally ask questions. Others just want to type them. Be flexible. Make sure everyone is paying attention to what's going on. Um, being at home at the moment can allow for users to get easily distracted. Uh, so, you know, your cat's walking in, your kids are asking you for something. So really try to keep the engagement going and review and follow up on your group's object objectives and goals quite regularly to ensure that everybody remains on the same page. So now I'm going to have a quick discussion around the various platforms that we've uh, used and what we think. This is again from our particular opinion. So we find Zoom to be a very, very, very useful 
As some of the pluses, okay, so the first thing to remember is Zoom is a free platform, but your free meetings only last for 45 minutes. So if you are planning on having meetings that are longer than that, you have to sign up for a premium subscription, and that can cost anything from um, $14.99 a month, um, and it does get more expensive dependent on what sort of ad add-ons you would like. So the nice thing about Zoom is that it has a registration page, so you can get information and you can even ask questions ahead of your meeting. Um, so say for instance, um, you wanted to understand the average age of those who are attending your meeting, um, find out where they're from, et cetera. You can do that initially on the registration page. So it gives you a good opportunity to get information from them beforehand. Um, Zoom allows recordings. So um, you can record either to the device or via the cloud which is really, really helpful because you can either load the groups on YouTube, et cetera, but they also provide you with a podcast. Um, you can have an audio function. You can get the video um, recording as well as the written transcript. So that makes things quite useful, particularly, I think, if you are uh, speaking to a multitude of platforms, uh, like, um, you know, some of your members might be um, visually impaired, et cetera, so then they get more than one option. So we really, really, really like Zoom, but unfortunately, Zoom is not free um, for long-term meetings and for webinars, et cetera. The functionality is limited on the, um, on the free version. Um, yeah, and also they have video and they also have screen sharing, which helps. Um, we have seen a lot of people moving over to M uh, Microsoft Teams at the moment. Um, I think from a business perspective, many people have a, a, a Microsoft 365 account which then automatically gives you access to Teams. So if you have a organizational account in any way, or you have Microsoft 365, you will automatically be able to access Teams. So it's free from that perspective. I, however, do find that the MS Teams um, interface is quite difficult. Um, so setting up your meeting parameters and permissions, et cetera, I find it to be quite difficult. I think Zoom's much easier. Um, but the good news about Teams, is that I think you can have up to 350 participants um, in a meeting. So it provides quite a large thing. And obviously to have MS Teams is free of charge provided that you have a 365 account. Um, and that's, I think about 85 Rand a month. So not overly expensive. Um, Teams also does allow you to record. It does allow you to have a chat function. It doesn't have a Q&A platform, uh, to my knowledge. Well, not that I've seen. So you can use the chat, but that chat is, you can set it up that it only comes to the admin administrators or the um, moderators of that group, uh, but you don't have the Q&A function like we have here on, on Zoom. And then there's the old fashioned Skype seeing less and less of Skype at the moment. Um, I don't think Skype's a great uh, great platform anymore. I think that they're quite outdated and I definitely think that you can do better. And then often, you know, we are now seeing Facebook. The, the downside to Facebook is that if, you've, if you're sharing across a page, um, it's very, very difficult to have obviously a two-way discussion. So Facebook Lives, et cetera, are great for one way. Facebook has now developed... Um, their online meetings it's called their rooms <coughs> which works really really well um you can have quite a few people join uh it's really really dynamic in the sense that most people have a facebook account and if you run a facebook group i think facebook would probably be your best opportunity to have um, an online an online meeting the downside to it again though is that that online meeting is shared um it's and you know it's shared externally so it's not very very personal uh, but i do know that facebook is doing a lot of work at the moment on um a lot of their sort of i want to say their business offerings in this regard given the the current context that everybody finds themselves in and I, i'm seeing new features and stuff come up quite regularly so i think facebook for a lot of the smaller groups particularly where you have an active audience already um you know, and you're running like an online support group on Facebook. Um, I think that that for meetings wouldn't, uh, would probably be the best option. And obviously it's free. You don't um, get recordings. However, it does go to your feed or on that group, but there isn't, um, it's not like you can download a, a recording link afterwards without sharing 
your Facebook groups link. So I think that that is a bit of a limitation. So I'm going to leave it there for now um, and go over to the questions. <clears throat> Holy, I'm sorry, my throat is so sore. <clears throat> okay. So uh, the first question, is the facilitator considered the same as a chair? Not necessarily. Um, a facilitator, I mean, the chair would essentially be the chairperson of the of the entity per se, the facilitator is merely focused on that particular meeting or that particular activity. How can technological issues be combated or even prevented? I think uh, Helena may have answered that question. If there's anything specific that you still would like me to answer, please um, pop it in the chat. Uh, Kelly, can you share and allow us to use this presentation to create the support groups or expand existing groups? Yes, we will send a copy of this presentation out to all the participants. So you will get a copy of this and absolutely use it. Um, we obviously, we've obviously put this together specifically because we want all of our members to be empowered. If you've ever thought to yourself, I want to host a support group, we want to give you the tools to be able to do that. I also want to take this opportunity to share that if you are a registered support group with rare diseases and you've registered as a full or an affiliate member, we will actually set these groups up for you and you can make use of our uh, premium Zoom facilities, etc. So if you're wanting to host a group, a discussion on anything like we have today uh, you, and you are registered with us, you're more than welcome to uh, contact us, give us the dates, etc. that you're wanting to have that meeting and we can set that up for you. Um, then I would like some advice on how to handle a support group where some members have lost their children, but will still need to post information, but we still need to post information and discuss discussions relevant to the children who are still alive in the group. Do we need to split the group or how do we go about the, uh, keeping the parents of the deceased children included and feeling supported? It's a very, very tough, uh, very, very tough question. And I don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong answer. I think that the best approach in that situation is to actually go back to the group and ask them what they would prefer. I know very often, um, I would say, you know, there's, a, there's, there's two sides to it. One, you, one is parents who don't want to be continuously reminded of the journey that they've gone through and are trying to move forward from it. And then you have others who feel that they don't honor their child's memory if they don't continue to participate. So I think it is a very, very sensitive uh, topic. And what I would do is I would, um, you know, have a discussion like this, um, set up a, a chat, an informal chat and say, um, we want to be fair to everyone in the group. We want to make sure that we don't offend anybody by posting anything. So we'd like to hear from you. What would you prefer? Um, we want to, you are still members of our community, regardless, you know, regardless of whether you, your child is, um, has passed away or is still alive. And we would really, really like um, to support you either way. And as a, you know, we just want to find out from you, what is the best way for us to do that for you? And I think it's just also very, very important to be flexible. Um, you know, some people like to communicate Verbally, some people like to only receive mail, some people, you've just got to really be flexible in how you approach it. And the next question, how do you decide when to address a question from a member on a support group as part of the group or when to address it privately? So I think, again, this is um, one of the things that you, you need to be able to, you know, you need to have set up those rules of engagement within your group. So it also depends on the answer. So um, maybe, maybe what you can do, Veronica, is pop me an example, and then I will give you feedback on how I do it, or we can actually open it up to everybody and see what everyone's suggestions are. Uh, then Janice has asked, do you have any tips on encouraging people to participate? We have lots of listeners, but no participants with questions or contributions. My group, my group is generally quite unresponsive. <clears throat> so... I think that this again, and don't, firstly, let me just say, we have some groups that are so active and other groups that are so not active. And um, I think largely it comes down to um, very often um, the type of information that the group wants is not always the same. So that's why it's always really important to understand 
what their perception as being members of the group is for the group. Um, if they are looking, you know, if they joined a WhatsApp group, as an example, merely as a way to get information, um, you might want to move them onto more of a broadcast list if they're looking for one-way communication. If they are saying, I know we're wanting two-way communication, but we want to have more discussions around A, B, and C, then at least then you know to start, to start having conversations that are structured around what it is that they want. I think one of the big it's not a flaw, um, but I think one of the errors in which we sometimes make is that we are passionate about something. So we start up a group presuming that people agree with where our passion is without actually understanding what they, you know, what their passion is or why they've joined. Um, and I, I'm guilty of it too. I often have to remind myself, hold on, is this Kelly's objective or is this the objective of the, of the group I'm dealing with at the time? So my suggestion, Janice, is to go back and determine exactly what it is that they are wanting from it. And you might find you lose people in the process, but that's okay, because at least the ones that you've retained um, are always uh, the ones that you are wanting for your, you know, for what you are intending. And also, I think um, it's it often helps a lot to share your own story, your own journey, etc. When they see vulnerability from others, uh, they often are more willing to open up, but understanding that often we join into these groups, but the, the people that we on these groups were are, are complete strangers to us um, and we're discussing sensitive stuff. So I think sometimes people are a little bit reluctant, um, but you find that often if you, if you start sharing as the group facilitator, that a lot of the time they will come and, and obviously support you. Uh, can you share any worst case scenarios you've experienced? Um, so I think probably the, the, the most difficult thing is when you see nastiness and, and almost bullying come through to some extent uh, when there's a different a difference of opinion. And it's always a, it's a really, really tough thing to remember and to, to you know, manage when there's a difference of opinion. But we, we all need to understand that we all have our own journeys and our own filters and our own perspectives. Um, and we, we have our own reasons for wanting to communicate and share. So it's really important that people feel safe enough to be able to say, um, yes, I agree with that because of X, Y, and Z and not be judged for it or abused um, for disagreeing. And it's exceptionally difficult when as the facilitator, someone disagrees with you, um, and says, actually, no, that's not how it should be, because we feel like, well, you know, jump in and do it then if you think it's so easy, and it's not. Um, but again, it's really, really important to be pragmatic and take a step back. And when you things are getting emotional, um, I've often um, participated in groups where things are getting really, really emotional, and then you just change the settings, particularly on WhatsApp, where you just change the settings to only admin can post for the next, and you say, guys, we, we're all going into a quiet time for two days um, so that everybody's emotions can calm down to protect, uh, to protect those that, um, that are obviously being attacked in that space. And then it's again, addressing the issue, look, and that you do privately. So if someone, if you feel someone's bullying somebody else or um, that they're not participating as per the group's rules of engagement, um, to address them privately and say, look, um, we've noticed that you're doing X, Y, and Z. We encourage you to do A, B, and C instead. And in the event that they don't continue or they continue with the bad behavior, then unfortunately you have no choice but to remove them. Um, I recently, this is from Nabila, I recently discovered that, that there's another support group for her condition. They're not keen on merging into one. Please advise, neither are registered and they weren't created by me. So, look, I think that there's, I mean, you know, everybody's open to starting up their own groups. It's, it can be really frustrating because it duplicates the work. Um, but you've just got to try ensure that you give the people that are part of your group as much information as that they are needing and that you participate into what their needs are. And hopefully um, when there's, 
when they the other groups can see the value in creating you know in the value in working together that you will be able to align but people get very very protective over these groups particularly when once you've started them and it's something that we see all the time um and it's really really important that just stick with what you know you know don't try overcomplicate it if they don't want to join that's their choice and that's fine just keep doing what you're doing and when people see consistency and they see that it is a safe place etc they might change their mind as things go progress um a question from helen timekeeping of speakers can be hard in a virtual scenario are there technology gadgets that can assist in his or her does it come down to just communicating communicating and gently interrupting so um there is there is a like a stop timer I mean, but it is, it's also really, really difficult to be like, okay, you've got two minutes start. So um, my suggestion is to keep track as the facilitator on your cell phone. When someone started talking, you know, just look down at the right hand corner of your computer screen, note that it's 857 and they should be finished by 859. And then while if you, if you have to, um, you can always use a, a non-verbal cue. So you can just raise your hand, etc., to notify them that they need to finish up. And if they continue, you, you will have to just gently say, look, sorry to interrupt, maybe we can carry this on offline. Um, but, you know, we all agreed at the beginning of this meeting that we would, we would have two minutes to respond to the time. And we now have to move on. And that's why by creating those uh, rules that everybody has bought into at the beginning of the meeting is so, so valuable, because in a moment like that, you can say, look, we all agreed that that's what we were going to do. They can't feel like you're bullying them or that you've interrupted them um, or cut them off short. Um, Christina, all the way from Kenya, how do you address group leadership burnout? Most of us are passionate about it, but sometimes life gets the better of us and we find ourselves falling behind. There is also the concept of founder syndrome, where there are ones with the most information, but disseminating it becomes a hurdle. Story of my life. So... With regards to the leadership burnout, definitely ask for help. Don't wait until you burnt out before you do it. From the very, very beginning, start asking for help. Start getting other people participating and on board. You're going to need them at some point. Um, when it comes to that founder syndrome, really, really difficult. I have the exact same problem of disseminating my knowledge. But again, if I worked, had worked closer and had let people in, earlier into what I was doing, so many more people would have knowledge. And I've learned over the years that there's so much value in disseminating the knowledge. I always thought, no, you know, I want to be the one to do it because I can I can help. But in actual fact, I've learned by empowering individuals is, is so much better. Teach a man to fish is so much more productive. And it actually strengthens our community to such a good, you know, such a great point. So um really get people into your circle let them see the work that you're doing let them be in your discussions by doing so they'll start picking up on things anybody who's met normsa from our office will tell you that when norms came into the office when she started working for us three years ago she had no idea about rare diseases she had never worked in, in the healthcare environment or a patient support group environment or whatever at all and normsa is so knowledgeable now and it has just come from her having access hearing the conversations, being a part of the conversations, she's developed a knowledge base as she's gone. Um, George, I see you have raised your hand. I'm gonna to come to you in one second. I've got one more question and then I will give you the opportunity to, um, to speak. I don't know if this is the place to ask, um, how do we create a safe place for patients experiencing suicidal thoughts and maybe a stronghold to guide them to open up and seek help? This is quite emotional. Um, Obviously, okay, it's emotional for personal reasons as well. Okay, so it's a very interesting, very interesting question, Nabila. Um, so I can tell you I've had this discussion with SADAC, who, as you will know, is the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. And they were actually, and it wasn't even something I'd even considered um, up until the time that they told, you know, spoke to me about it. But particularly with suicide, very often, say, for instance, um, someone in the group is discussing, you know, that they've had a really, really bad day and they um, are thinking about, you know, just slitting their wrists like they can't carry on anymore. 
that can actually be a trigger for someone who may or may not have had previous thoughts around this regard. And, um, you know, now hearing it, visualizing it, uh, people who've gone through that experience and have found some form of relief previously in their lives through that process can automatically be triggered to go do, to go act in that way again. So you want people to be able to address suicide with you, obviously, so that you can get them the necessary help, but to engage with them around suicide in a public platform is not recommended. And so my advice to you would be, if, if there's anybody that you're querying concerned about that from a suicide perspective, or alternatively, if someone mentions it on the group, to immediately contact them personally and put them in touch with the likes of SADAC. Um, SADAC has their suicide hotline. SADAC's very, very familiar with rare diseases and our stuff. Um, I often speak to them and we have lots of communication on the issues that we're seeing so that they, uh, counselors, et cetera, know about it. You automatic, you are always welcome to notify me so that I can notify SADAC directly of the fact that there is this patient and needing, you know, needing support. Um, but my suggestion in that regard would be to to uh, to not try burden take that on that responsibility on yourself we cannot do it i have and will once again if necessary arrange specific training through sadac for anybody who wants it on the best ways to process that sort of information and what the things to do are i'm happy to arrange that they they do those courses quite regularly and i think it's of huge importance but definitely don't on don't onboard it yourself refer them out and do it in a personal environment. Don't uh, discuss those things on the main group because of the fact that um, it can actually be a trigger for others. So that uh, brings us to the close of those questions. Um, George, I'm going to try to find and un to unmute you. Um, your hand's down now. Please put it up if you are still wanting to ask something, just that I know that that is what you're still wanting to do. Okay, um, George, I see your hand's not up anymore. So maybe it was an error. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if there's any more questions. Um, that is it uh, that I see there. So I'm just gonna go through the last few bits. Um, so the conclusion, support groups are super effective way to provide support and guidance to a group of people without a huge investment um, of time or money. Um, if you're wanting to start a support group, our advice is to just get out there and start doing it. <clears throat> don't overthink it. Don't wait for the right time. Don't wait for the time where you've got enough money, experience, et cetera, et cetera. Just by thinking that you want to be able to help people, you will be able to. Just give me one second. Cody. Sorry, I'm shouting at the puppy who is eating something on the floor which I think might actually be the carpet hey oh, there we go sorry I threw something at him and that should work don't do that again naughty okay we hope this step-by-step -step guide helps you start your support group and that you um, are able to you know communicate with us come tell us your problems let us know what challenges you're facing say to us like you know we're battling with this we want to have more of these discussions uh, can you help us do you have an idea if we don't know, we might know somebody who does. So just discuss it. And that's why our patient voices group is so important because it gives everybody the opportunity to jump in and um, you know also help each other with the issues that you're facing. Rare diseases doesn't necessarily, well, when I say rare diseases, I mean us or our team, doesn't necessarily have to be the, the people that provide you with solutions. Networking is everything. Um, so we really encourage you guys to do it. I hope we've empowered you. You've got this, you can absolutely do this. Um, we have absolute faith in all of you and we know that you you guys can so if you've been thinking about doing it just get on with it and do it once again a big thank you to Novartis um, for sponsoring this meeting and then that's the team if you need to contact anybody you can um, before closing I just want to say you guys might notice that Nicola's been cropped out of this photo uh, this is actually Nicola's last She's five minutes. She's given us five minutes more than she's had to. Um, it's Nicola's last day today. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank her so much for everything that she's done for our organization over the last three and a half years and to wish her all the best on her future endeavors. Um, next, we're going to miss you. Thanks again for getting this webinar off and getting it out on time. Um, I don't know how we're going to do it without you. I know we'll miss you lots. 
So that is it, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Sorry, we've run a little bit over time. Thanks so much for participating. And we look forward to chatting to you guys all in the future. Uh, yeah, let us know if you have any issues. We will email this out. Um, and we really look forward to working on you in building a much stronger supported community. So thanks, guys. Hope you guys are all keeping well and keeping safe. And we look forward to chatting soon. Cheerio.